that included parts of Colorado, parts of Texas, parts of California, going right up to La Plata in Canada. This civilization known as Olmec was to touch all other civilizations in America, the Maya, the Toltec, the Aztec, etc. It was even to stretch right out into South America. What is very unusual about this civilization was that not only was it the mother of American civilizations, but it contained elements that were not just native to America, but was a fusion between the Native American and people coming from outside. The most significant of those outsiders were the Africans. We have very clear evidence in stone heads, in terracottas that are clay sculptures, as well as skulls and skeletons of an African physical type entering that native population somewhere between 948 and 680 BC. How do we know the date? It is because on one of the platforms in the holy center and capital of the Olmec world, a place called the Venta, we were able to date the stone head because they were rooted in a wooden platform where the Americans worship, and we got this dating of 948 to 680 BC. Now, several people have wondered what kind of Africans these were. Who were these outsiders? These were largely Egypto-Nubian types. At least that type was in command. Because what we do find in the evidence is that not merely the presence of this physical type, which is African, but the presence of cultural elements, which we will talk about in this program, which are clearly of Egypto-Nubian origin. And the question arises, why do we include Egypt among classical African civilizations. There is now absolutely no doubt that the ancient Egyptian civilization was overwhelmingly African. They have found the kingdom of Ta-Seti in the Nile Valley, where all the major elements, political and religious elements, spring out of Egyptian, spring out of the south of Egypt, spring out of the Nubian world, at Kustal in Nubia, where we have about a dozen black kings reigning before the first Egyptian dynasty. Even the hieroglyphs, the writing system of the Egyptians, we find they have their roots in the Sudan, so that as the Africans move up from Nubia, they go into Egypt, so that we find the African, not only in the evening of Egyptian civilization, but in its very dawn. And we find them also at the, in the noon dynasties. This is very important because it's important to understand that the Egyptian thing, the Egyptian miracle, was not only to touch Europe, not only to touch Asia, but was to stretch out to America as well. <laughs> beginning of this museum I was made the information about from the picture from where they got at the face then when we was passing in the other house you saw those pictures when they found the faces this is one of the face more beautiful you can see the lips the nose the eyes this is completely negroid face and the weight of this face is 25 tons. We're wondering 
how they carry in that time, from where they carry these rocks, because it's solid. This head they bring from 134 kilometers far from here. Yes. So it has a little thing. No. Was that stone quarried where they found it, or how far did they have to bring the quarry stone? They say from 100 kilometers far. They call basalt. Basalt. Is it one solid piece? It is one solid piece. From 25 tons. What is the uh, relationship between this head and the uh, African presence in the New World? Well, they showing it to you the exactly origin, Negroide, basic origin for these peoples. Why do you think they made that? Uh, they would call uh, a Negroid head. What would be the significance of that? To, to show uh, when these people was arrived to this continent. They tried to demonstrate when they arrived to America. And that was before Christ. About 1200 years BC was the time when they made these faces. Were these heads looked at as uh, gods, uh, as uh, priests? Uh, priests. They were priests. Priests. So then the African present here was one of priesthood or what? Priest. One of priesthood. Yes. Are there any other heads this size for the other races of people? No, this is the most principal. Uh, Dr. Van Sertiman, can you make a comment on this? I was asking him the significance of this in terms of the, the importance in the society of these heads, and he was saying that these were represented priests. Yes, these are, this is the priest king class because um, it, it would appear that these people were among the ruling uh, elite of the Olmec. Um, and these heads were revered. In fact, on one of them you have a flat top and you have an altar where people worshipped. And there is another one in which you have a, a sort of eustachian tube that runs from the ear through the mouth so that the priest could stand at the back of the head and talk to the people. It was a kind of oracular thing, you know, a sort of oracle. Um, we'll see this, 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 um, this is one of the, the great heads. And one of the things that you should note too, which many people do not note, is the way that thing falls along the ear. And also note the, in, the, the not the, the markings, the way it is cut, the way it is eroded on top, because the top of the, the helmet is also very important to note um, the things right on the, on, the, on the brow, the way these are formed. Because this is the way in which, e even on top, I don't know how we can get on top there, but there's something quite interesting on the very top of the head. There are certain striations on the top of the head that are also significant. <laughs> Be close attention to everything that is said tonight and that you should prepare yourself to ask questions about the many troubling problems that beset pre-historic America. It is not really pre-historic, it is merely pre-Spanish, but anything that is pre-European is considered to be pre-historic. It is the really critical missing pages of history, both for America and for Africa. And what I want to do tonight, apart from touching on what we have seen within the last day or two at Mitla and at Monte Alban, what I would like to do 
is to go on to make a summary of what we have achieved, what we have seen, what we have witnessed in the last week in Mexico. We began in Von Wutenow's studio. Make no mistake, there is no studio in the world where you will find such a collection of African physical types in ancient America. Many of you have not had the opportunity to examine closely at leisure all the pieces in that collection. It is a priceless collection and many of you have raised the question which must be pursued, what will happen when von Wutenow, who is now 84, dies? What will happen to a collection which is of tremendous significance for us blacks throughout the third world? Because the likelihood is, as has happened in previous centuries, the likelihood is that all of these marvelous pieces which we have seen and which we have not yet had time to photograph completely and to preserve may disappear. Von Wutenow has, in addition to these little sculptures, he has a catalog of everything he has. Brilliant photographs taken by several professionals over the years. He is apparently the director of the dancing group. And this is a man, and his, his features are totonac. They are not Negroid, but they paint them, paint them with chapopote, so it is a warrior who is black. That is also an atavismo because they knew that the Olmecs were black. You're saying that the Olmec people themselves were black? No. No, but this one certainly was black. You see, you can't see. And here is the proof for it. It's one of the best proofs I have. This is a figure made that is between the Olmecan period and the Totonacan period, transition period. And this is an Olmec sculpture, and to be black, they covered it with tar. You see, it's a stone head, but it's covered with this tar. So not only the features and the thick lips come out, primitive, but it is made black. Yes. This, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, this piece was uh, put on the cover of uh, um, a revista of, uh, in Mexico on March and uh, shows you that another colossal Olmec head was found in Mexico which has not been, in my opinion, I, can, I don't know where it is, it's never exhibited. I wonder if they really have excavated it. Of course, you see these uh, <coughs> There is an item that uh, the people in Tabasco, the Tabasco is, uh, is one of the provinces here, I mean one of the states, the state, just as Louisiana is a state. And the people in Tabasco don't want it to disappear from their place to uh, Mexico City. And there are frictions between the Instituto de Antropología and the state, you see, and that's why I don't know if they've done in the States something about it. In any case, it has not been shown up here in Mexico City. But it is 100% Negroid uh, features, and um, I wish we could get it out and get some of you. To the choice of archaeological sites to link all that we have seen together as a single piece. This is one of the most difficult things to do in Mexico. There's a vast amount of confusion, even among the guides who are supposed to have mastered the material in their own area. There's a vast amount of confusion about dates, about the occupation of sites, about the nature of influences, about what the various things we have seen mean. Some of these things cannot yet be explained. Some of these things people can only guess at. But what we are certain of, what we are absolutely certain of, is that the Olmec civilization, which is the mother of all American civilizations, is not a single-stranded civilization. It does not belong to one race. It does not belong to what we conceive of as the Native American who came across the Bering Straits. There obviously were other influences, and among those influences was the African, specifically 
the Egypto-Nubian of the Mediterranean. When we look in Von Wutenow's studio, we see quite a number of heads, most of them pre-classic. By pre-classic is meant periods between, say, about 1000 BC, going right down to about 600 BC. This is a significant phase in Olmec civilization. There are several phases of the Olmec. I must deal with phases now, and those of you who are taking notes, please note, because you can get very confused when you see the Olmec appearing in other places in later centuries and becoming mixed up with other peoples. This is some of the things that lead to confusion. We must understand that in the capitals of the Olmec world, in the Olmec morning, or the morning of that Olmec world, you have people coming into the site, occupying these sites as early as 1200 BC at La Venta, the holy capital, as early as 1500 BC at San Lorenzo. Those dates have nothing to do with the actual sculptures, the actual monuments, etc. People walk into a site and start to occupy it because they find there is land there, there they can uh, plow the fields, they can grow crops, they can eat, etc. They don't just walk in today and tomorrow they start building colossal sculptures and massive ceremonial platforms and pyramids, etc. So when people come into a site, it has nothing to do with when the flowering, the high point, the climax of the civilization occurs. The Olmecs came into their sites pretty early as early as 1500 BC at San Lorenzo, as early as 1200 BC at La Venta. You must look carefully at this map and see the diamond points. Those are the capitals. And those diamond points show you where the Olmec first made their major settlements. Now it is as early as 1858 that Mexicans became aware of these sites. Remember that just like in Egypt, a great civilization flourished and then died. And then people forgot all about it. The pyramids lay under the sand, the sphinx lay under the sand. Some things stood there like enigmatic witnesses of a glorious past. But many people continued to live for centuries without recovering the majesty of that civilization, without being able to go back to their roots. This is what happened in many of the great cities of the Americas that for a long time, for centuries, a shadow fell upon this world. Something very unusual seemed to happen somewhere around 8900. Some people put it slightly later, but something very unusual happened in America. It may have been some kind of cataclysm, it may have been an epidemic, it may have been the upheaval, some revolution in which the elite was overthrown and many of the marvelous statues and many of the marvelous platforms were abandoned. We do not know exactly what happened. It was suggested by Victor Damas at Palenque that there was an epidemic of cholera and that could account for the disappearance of people. And that may be a plausible explanation for the disappearance of some of the people from the Mayan sites. But when we come to the Olmec morning, which I want to dwell upon because it affects everything, when Michael Coe and others speak of the Olmec as the mother of American civilization, they are really stating the whole thing in a sentence. It really is. Because in the Olmec morning, on that great platform at, at La Venta, we find quite a number of things that is to affect the civilization centuries afterwards. But let me come back to 1858. 1858 was the discovery at Tres Zapotes of a stone head. Now this is the stone head. This is the first head to be discovered. Now look closely at this head. When the Mexicans saw this head, when their scholars saw this head, scholars like Orozco Ibera, Jose Melgar, etc., they were absolutely convinced that there were Africans in America at some ancient time. Why were they convinced? They were convinced by two things. By the African physiognomy, the, 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 the dome of the forehead, the 
the cut of the nose, the, the, the jaw, the mouth, etc., but also by something which has never been mentioned in the archaeology for some odd reason. And that is, at the back of the stone head, there was hair, detailed Ethiopian type hair. No Native American has hair like that. And if that was presented in the archaeology, all this nonsense about babies and jaguars, I have never seen a jaguar with hair like that. And I've never seen a baby with a face like that. People had to find explanations for things they found embarrassing. It is similar to the discovery of the great civilization of Tarseti, the kingdom rather of Tarseti in the Nile Valley which precedes the Egyptian. The man who found the Tarseti, Kitsil, never said a word about it. He died without saying anything. And it was left to Bruce Williams, who many of us will hear in Atlanta in September. It was left to Bruce Williams, his student, to take it out to the back rooms of the University of Chicago Oriental Institute and present it to the world. They said they took, the reason why they delayed so long is because it took 15 years to put the pieces together. Without all those pieces, the stoneware vessels, etc., the pottery that was found, the stone incense burner at the site of Tarseti at Kustal, the site of Kustal, did not need putting together. It was intact from the very beginning. What needed to be put together were their heads. And that was not put together until the head who had a right to put it together died. Thank God. It is absolutely important for us to take a very serious view of this because we find again and again and again that you have a deliberate effort to wipe out the evidence, to hide it, to explain it away. Why is it that this photograph, even now, I am not permitted to use that until 1985 because it involves a whole series of things. But why is it that this head is not among the heads at Villa Hermosa? Is not among the heads in the National Geographic or the Smithsonian or any traveling circus of all heads? It is hidden at Tuxla where nobody goes. It's very important to note that that was the first head found and it had a profound effect. Although it was the only thing found at that time that indicated an African influence. It was left to the expeditions of 1938 and 1939, expeditions carried out jointly by the Smithsonian Institute, the University of California, and the National Geographic before they found more of these stone heads. They recovered the one at Tres Zapotes, and then they went on the next year in 1939 they went on to La Venta, and then they found four of these stone heads. They also found, and mo many of you have noted this in the museum at Villa Hermosa, at La Venta Park, you have noted the plan of the city. I want you to look at that plan carefully. There is the first pyramid in America. There is the first step pyramid. There are the arms of the village, and on those arms stand the great stone heads facing the Atlantic Ocean. This is in the Gulf of Mexico. This is at the point which on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico where the, you find the terminus of the Atlantic currents from Africa because the currents from Africa take you to northeastern South America, into the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico, swinging towards Florida. And then if you are lucky, if you learn as the Africans were later to learn, perhaps not at this period, you can find a circular current that takes you back towards Europe and Africa. Here at La Venta, they began to see a distinctive art style. Here at La Venta, they began to see something in the faces of the monuments, something in the traits, the cultural traits of the Olmec that was to leave its stamp on later civilizations like the Maya, out in Palenque, out in Monte Alban, out in Mitla, even in the evening 
the twilight of the gods at Tihotihuacan, out at Tatilco, at Cerro de las Misas, in the Monte Alban phase, all of these are branches coming out of the mother culture, the Olmec. And there is something very distinctive. Here, for the first time at Leventa, are the pyramids. Here, for the very first time, is found the sarcophagus, like in Egypt. Here, for the very first time, are monumental stelae and sculptures of colossal proportions. Here, for the very first time, are the great priest kings. Here, for the very first time, are enormous ceremonial temples and altars built to the gods. Some things must be said about the stone heads, which you must note. There is one of them that has a tube running from the air out of the mouth, which was featured as an oracle, and it has a flat top which functioned as an altar. This is very important because it is that kind of oracular um, thing that was found in Egypto Nubian the period. In order for the priest kings of the Egyptians to hold the world together, which was being torn apart, the, the Bible describes Egypt at that time like it, it describes its, the great factions and frictions in Egypt at that time. They speak, speak of it as some sort of a torn nation. And in order to pull it together, they had to find once again the power of religion. Religion is responsible for the extraordinary vitality that built the temples and the pyramids and the great tombs of both Egypt and America. Note that. People do not do those extraordinary things. Only giants could do those things. Man becomes a giant when he develops a peculiar kind of focus, when there's a crystallization of his psychic energy. In civilizations that are highly fragmented, that have lost all their certitudes and cannot find again any kind of certitude and focus and power, the tremendous capacity to have the consciousness to operate as a giant is lost. Only giants can build those things. It has nothing to do with size, because the American is small in, in size. It has nothing to do with um, machines, because the Egyptian machines were crude compared to the machines we have today. It has to do with a peculiar kind of consciousness which made it possible for one to do things so monumental that even we now, with our great machines, cannot attempt to do what the Africans did. It is so, it, it is so ex extraordinary that just a few years ago, the American government sent out a team to study how the Egyptians moved heavy objects across the sand. And in spite of all of our technology, when one of the great nuclear things, with nuclear reactors were being used, moved across the deserts, of the desert of, of at Geri, they used the identical method the ancient Egyptians used. This is the high technology, the 20th century, looking for a method that was the most practical and efficient method for moving a heavy object across the sands. So you're not dealing here with primitives, in spite of the ancient nature, in spite of the time, the prehistoric time of these cultures and civilizations, you're dealing with highly sophisticated people, a state of mind, a consciousness that made it possible for this extraordinary leap to occur. And the peculiar thing about the Olmec is that that leap occurs with all the Egyptian elements in it. It had its own native elements, it had its jaguar. The jaguar is not Egyptian. Nobody in Egypt or Nubia has a jaguar that they worship. There's a little cat cult in Nubia which I noted but it's not equivalent at all to the great jaguar which prowled the swamps of the Ol Olmec. Why then suddenly they start with things which are duplicated nowhere else in the world in such a complex, in such a combination, in such an arbitrary combination. The stelae with the hieroglyphs, the monumental sculpture, the sarcophagus, the pyramids, the step and the true pyramid, and all of these elements, uh, even including, as I have shown, the bird and the serpent on the crown of the Egyptians and the Olmec, 
and all of the monarchic traits, a whole series of monarchic traits that distinguish royalty in the Almic world and in the Egyptian world. Clearly, we have evidence of some kind of body of people who came into the Almic world at that time. And there is a reason for this, because people have asked, okay, fine, all right, people can cross the Atlantic, fine, you have proven they have boats, fine, but why did they come here? The Egyptians have no business in the Atlantic, which is true. The Egyptians have no business in the Atlantic. The Atlantic is very, very far from Egypt. And Egyptian ships have no right in the Atlantic circa 800 BC. The reason why they are in the Atlantic at all, in the North Atlantic, is because of an unusual situation that is, an occurring, that is occurring in the Mediterranean at that point in time. It is very important, therefore, not only to study what was happening in Mesoamerica, but to study what was happening at that point in time in Egypt and Nubia. What you have is a war going on between Africa and Asia. The Asiatics are attacking everyone in the Mediterranean. They're, they have smashed the Hittites. They have taken iron smelting process from the Hittites. They have smashed the Phoenicians. They've made vassals of the Phoenicians who are, have always been servants of the Egyptians and the Nubians. Fifty percent of the Egypto-Nubian navies are have our Phoenician. These are a people who Sheikh Ante Diop claims were once black, who like the Arabs who were once totally black in Saudi Arabia became mixed with Asiatics and you get this what you call the Semitic type. So that you have a mixed type Phoenician which it gets, gets black again as it enters North Africa and begins to intermingle once again with black people until by the time of Hannibal, the Phoenician or Punic type is African. This type is restless up and down the Mediterranean. It has its cities at Tyre and Sidon, its great ports, but it's restlessly moving up and down the Mediterranean. And because the Asiatics block the seaports to the Indian Ocean, block the seaports to the Pacific, and we do have evidence of the Egyptians in the Pacific, we have Egyptian script found in Hawaii. These guys are ranging far out. Nothing stops the Egyptian. Wherever you go, you find him. I have found him in Spain. They have Egyptian villages in Spain. Where Barry Fell has shown the cartouches of the Libyan kings around 1000 BC are found at Almuneca, Spain. And that runs right through the, the, the Spanish mention in their early chronicles that Tahaka, the Nubian general who is later to become the king of Nubia and Egypt, enters Spain in a, with the garrison so that the Africans are already in Europe. They're invading. They come in with the garrison into Spain and then they retreat back because they have their own problems at home. So that we have evidence of movements in the direction west of the Mediterranean towards Africa, towards that part of Africa. And more and more fleets were driven, both military as well as commercial fleets were driven west of the Mediterranean because tin was needed for the Bronze Armies, because this was the late Bronze Age. Copper was needed in Cyprus, tin was needed. They went right up into the British Isles and the North Atlantic searching for tin. And around 600 BC, we have the Phoenicians going from Ezion Geber and going right down and coming right across Africa, right round Africa, right back into the Mediterranean. The Europeans did not go into the Atlantic because the Europeans were terrified of the Atlantic. The Europeans spoke of the Straits of Gibraltar as if there were monsters in the sea. They did not attempt any movement in that area. But the Phoenicians did, and they were very much tied up, as I say, with African navies. That is the reason why many of the great heads have military helmets. Not all of them do, but they're distinguished by military helmets. They are a warrior dynasty, because this is a period of war. 
For, more, for nearly 200 years, the world is in a state of war, as we are. For the last, since 1930, since the 1930s right up to the 1980s, every major army in the world has been ready to fight. We are in that state in which the Egypt, both the Africans and the Asiatics were. We cannot relinquish that state in this century until there actually is a war which God forbid. But we cannot relinquish that state. All armies are armed to the teeth in the 20th century world. Regardless whether you go down into Latin America, whether you go into the Caribbean, whether you go into Africa, whether you go to Israel, whether you go into Russia, whether you go through Eastern Europe, every army on earth now is armed to the teeth, ready and waiting for the conflagration, which, pray God, may never come. But that was the state of the world. Where Therefore, a warrior dynasty appears with the great helmets. The warrior dynasty appears among the Olmec, carrying all of these elements. You find that apart from the stone heads which we have seen, we see cultural traits which I have mentioned, and then we go on to see, as I have also mentioned, that when the Olmec move out of Leventa and they send elite parts of their elite out at Platilco, at Cerro de las Misas, and at Monte Alban. When they study the skeletal evidence right in this territory at Monte Alban, when they go to the graves in this very part of Mexico, in Oaxaca, when they go to the graves of Monte Alban and they look at the ruling class, not the common people, the common people have nothing to do with it, the common people are Zapotec, later they're Mixtec, etc., but the ruling class, when they go into the graveyards, 4.5% of the ruling class here at Monte Alban is African. As much as 13.5% at Platilco is African. They're not in the common graves. And you can tell because side by side with the native, you're finding a different nose bridge, which remains in skeletal evidence. There's a ridge. There is a nasal index. There is a brow ridge, there are structures of the jaw, there are lengths of the arm. The African arm is different from the Asiatic arm. The, the lengths, the, the, proportional, the proportions of the body are different. You find not only skulls, but extended skeletons for study at Latilco. And Berzinski making allowance for all the blending and mixing of things still comes out with the conservative estimate of 13.5. We even have graves where you have an African male lying beside a Native American female, indicating that you already you're having mixings and meltings into different kind of population in some places. And when the all mix stretched out, when we went to Tihotihuacan, that is the evening, that is quite late. Tihotihuacan is around the birth of Christ. This is long after the morning of the Almec. But there again you see the Almec. You see the jaguar at Tihotihuacan. And you see the jaguar undergoing a strange transition where the plume serpent is becoming the powerful thing in Mexico, which it was in Egypt. In America, the United States, the stars and stripes is our great emblem. In Egypt, it was the plume serpent. In Mexico, it is the plume serpent. Even today, the plume serpent is the stars and stripes of Mexico as it was the stars and stripes of ancient Egypt. Can all this be coincidence? Here at Teotihuacan, here they're building this enormous pyramid, and here all the major principles of the Egyptian pyramid are in evidence. The base is identical, identical. Some people had said it was one meter off, but now they find that the meter mistake is, is what they calculate for error in the reconstruction of the site. Because all those sites, that pyramid was buried under the ground. They did not see it. Many of these things that we're seeing today were not visible in Mexico 30 years ago or 40 years ago. People only started digging those things up out under the earth. This is not all standing here looking at the Mexican. They had to find those things again. They found some levels and then they had to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. The story is still 
largely untold. Victor Damas has pointed out at Palenque, which was called Palque, that they have 400 temples in the jungles. They haven't started digging yet. They don't have the money. And as you know, with archaeologists, they have their political reasons for digging. Look at Leventa. That's the most important site. Nobody can go to Leventa unless he is an archaeologist sent out by the government. The oil fields are there. They don't allow anybody to come into Leventa. That's on the big shroud. They're doing a lot of excavation. They're finding things. Not a word about what they're finding. We go to Palenque. Palenque is only partly dug up. You see the great tomb and temple. They say it's the only burial found in the pyramid. That is not true. It is the only complete man found in a tomb at the bottom of a pyramid in America. But there can be, there mention many, many pyr pyramids in the Americas in which you have urns, one or two sarcophagi, skeletons, all sorts of things found in the, in, the, in, the, in the hollow of the pyramids. So that there's, it is evidence that, evidence that there is, they were not only used as temples, but as tombs. People have said that there is a distinction to be drawn between the American pyramids and the Egyptian pyramids. That the American pyramids are step, whereas the Egyptian pyramids are conical. That American pyramids are used only as temples, whereas Egyptian pyramids are used as tombs. This is not true. The Egyptians began building the step pyramid, which you find at Leventa. When the great black genius Imhotep began building pyramids, he did not build a conical pyramid, he built a step pyramid. There are many step pyramids. Not very many, but they're still surviving out of the 60 pyramids that survived the 60 major pyramids in a complex in Egypt or Nubia. There are several of them that are step pyramids, just like in America. Then the Egyptians started filling in the steps so that when you x-ray some of the pyramids, you can still see the steps, although you don't see it with the naked eye. If you x-ray some of them, you can see the steps because the step is built at the core because it more easily solves the problem of the ratio of run to rise in the building of that enormous thing. It's called the second of the pyramid in mathematics. So that it makes it easier to build a conical pyramid by putting the steps and then filling it up. It is true that as an idea or a concept moves from one continent to another, regardless of the nature of the influence, however profound, since natives are building it, not Africans, and Af Africans couldn't build Tihotiwakan, Africans influenced the building. To build Tihotiwakan must have taken more than a million people. There weren't a million Africans in America. So that you have native labor, that is people who are living here are building, but the ideas, the engineering, even before they started to build, these guys worked it out like Washington DC. They have grid patterns, they have quadrants, they plan the whole city even before they start to put down the first brick. Obviously you're not dealing with guys who had never entered urban worlds before because there was no urban complex in all America. Leventa was a great ceremonial city, yes, but real urban life begins at Teotihuacan. So here are these peasants going to sit down one day and say, let us build a city and let us work out all the structures exactly as the city could be worked out so that all of these lines are drawn in a certain way. That is exactly what happened. Only an elite who had the intimacy and familiarity with such structures could actually sit down and plan it out before they even start to lift the first brick. So what we're dealing with is conceptual diffusion, the diffusion of ideas, the diffusion of certain kinds of ideas from people who have been working in this for a long time. We're not talking about Africans building the pyramid. Consequently, therefore, when you see the pyramid in America, you see a different configuration. Superficially, it is different. But it has all, Tihotihuacan has all three functions that the Egyptian pyramid has. It is a temple, it is a tomb, 
they have found skeletons inside of the rooms at Tihotihuacan and they haven't dug all of Tihotihuacan up yet. There's still hidden temples, hidden, hidden passages, sorry, inside of Tihotihuacan and it functions as a geodetic marker. That base is not an accident to build that base. You have to know all the astronomical knowledge Egyptians knew. You have to know the circumference of the earth. You have to know all of all the units of measurement which came out of the sky, the study of the sky, because we did not make the inch. The Africans did not make the inch by accident. They didn't get up one morning and somebody says, look, let me take my little finger. This is an inch. They didn't build a second of time by accident. The second of time was worked out by the relationship of the sun in its movement across the earth, the rotation on its axis, the rotation of the earth on its axis, all of those things. Those are astronomical things. You cannot have units of measurement without astronomy. Mathematics and astronomy are related, just like geometry is related to the to the, um, the problems they solved in the inundation of the Nile. So all of these things were carried over. Why are they using units of measurement the Egyptians are using? Why when you go to some of the burials you find the canop like in, in Egypt you have canopic jars in the north, south, east and west and they have four distinct colors to mark the cardinal points. The Chinese have distinct colors to mark the cardinal points. They're not like the Egyptian. They are not like the Egyptian. No Asiatic color scheme marking the cardinal points are like the Egyptian. But the early Mexicans are doing it exactly like the Egyptian. How did they arrive at that color scheme? And later on they change it. But at that point of time of contact, they are using the identical color scheme of the four cardinal points. They came across the Bering Strait. They're proto-Asiatic. Why are they not using Asiatic color scheme? Obviously, an inference is coming. They have calendars. The Mexicans have more calendars than anybody else. Why, in addition to the three other calendars they had, they introduced a fourth calendar, which is Egyptian with the identical 365.25. They have their own conks, they have their own, they've worked out their own native mathematics. Why then are they taking this into their system? All of these things have to be explained. Why at Elvia John in the Olmec world, in the heart of the Olmec world, there is paper fung made from wood pulp. Nowhere on earth is paper made from wood pulp except among the Egyptians at this point in time? Why are they moving enormous stones which they never moved before from vast quarries using the same method of breaking stone and linking it together? Using the same methods of moving the stone as the Egyptians? Bringing it down the swamps? Why is their agriculture identical as on the Nile? They're dealing with the same flood problems. Why they're responding in exactly the same way. They have the same hydraulic system of agriculture. You go down in Peru, which is touched by this, you see the terraced agriculture like in Egypt. Why are they doing all of these things? All their kings are carrying these things. They have the plume serpent motif. They have the great earrings under their ears. They have, the, they have their beards as an index of rank and royalty. They have the purple. The use of purple. Yesterday, for example, I caught our guide, Hector, saying that these things were painted red. I said, are you sure you mean red? He said, yes. I said, well, tell me what makes the red. What do they use to make red? He says, cochineal. I said, that's not red. Cochineal is the equivalent in the Mediterranean of the murex shell purple. Cochineal makes purple. All the temples in America, wherever they paint, they paint purple. They even painted the stone heads purple. Medinel Zanel found the patch of purple on one of the stone heads and found that the weathering of time, the erosion of the years, have taken the purple off the stone heads. That's the color they use in Egypt. That's the color they use in, in painting when the main color used in painting temples is purple because purple is emblematic of the power of the gods. 
And the reason why the Egyptians struck on that is was by a peculiar arbitrary phenomenon that the murex shell, before it reached its final fixed purple, went through a series of tints, which were like that of the Nile in flood. Now most of you are city people who, con who think that water is colorless or crystal. Water is not. This is only one kind of water. There is red water, there is blue water, there is green water, there is yellow water, there is brown water, there is silver water, there is crystal water, there is black water. All of these types of things, if you lived on rivers as I did, or you lived on the Nile as the Egyptians did, you will find the water goes through many color changes. In fact, after thunderstorm or a lightning storm, every color on earth, every color of the rainbow is on the water. And if you were accustomed, just like people who live with, among cattle, every cattle has a different color and marking. So that if you're accustomed, your eye to cattle, you know that this is Jimmy and this is Johnny, etc. You don't mix the two things. You can tell one cattle from the other. We can't because we are not cattle people. And most of us can't tell water color from another water color because you're not water people. You don't live on rivers. And it is because of this that they were able to make a connection between the color scheme of the fluid in the murex shell before it hit purple with the color scheme of the Nile and flood. And because it seemed identical to them barring a tint or two, they concluded that the color purple was sacred because the Nile is sacred. That is why they worshipped it and that is why common people could not use purple. I told you, for example, of the case of Margaret Hanke, who wrote a, a monograph recently on purple, in which she showed that purple became so important in the Mediterranean, every European pope, every European king has a bit of purple taken from the Egyptians. They then took up purple. The Phoenicians ran up and down the Mediterranean with Tyrian purple. They, they destroyed all the ports that had the murex shell until the murex shell was exhausted. And some people say that the Phoenicians came over here with the Africans searching for purple. Cochineal, which is American, nowhere on earth is cochineal found. It has been found stamped on caves in North Africa. It doesn't belong to Africa. Barry Fell and his colleagues found cochineal, and it's been analyzed and examined, and they found it on, on some caves in North Africa. And the cost of purple was so great that one L or yard of purple could be sold for nearly a million dollars at a certain point in time. Only kings could buy purple. It was not the common people. All of these are things that seem to link up the old world with the new. The Almec then go on not only touching Tihotiwakan, they seem to go on to touch other places. We saw Mitla yesterday. Mitla does not have very much to offer us because Mitla is almost raised to the ground. You saw the savagery with which the Spanish struck Mitla. So that our friend could tell us that 70% of the population were destroyed by the Europeans. 70% were destroyed by the Europeans within a matter of 50 years. And you find their temples raised to the ground. And I raised with him the question of something, the question which intrigues us is that there is a secret passageway at Mitla which has not been found since the 16th century, which was found by some of the Dominican priests, where they found an enormous burial, and they closed it up, and, and it was never found again. There are lots of secrets at Mitla, but there again you find all Mekilid coming in, and then the, the Zapotecan and other people operating at Mitla. At Monte Alban, we have something very extraordinary occurring. Monte Alban seems to be evidence of an Olmec elite which landed in the place and as building began in new ceremonial centers, they were sacrificed. They were overthrown, it seems, by the people, the Zapotec, the people who were in that area. 
what evidence do we have that these are not dances? Because at first they said they were dances, and recently they started this nonsense about hospital. That how these are sick people, that's why they look so strange. You know those people. First of all, their eyes are closed. They have a distorted pose and posture. And they're in a strange state and their loins have been cut out in some cases. You can actually see the castration occurring. Now I do not know of any sickness that causes people's testicles to fall out. Because that is what they're presenting as a new theory now. This is a hospital at Monte Alban. That is why you have these figures. Do you know, we only saw a few of them, 140 140 of those types have been found at Monte Alban. And they indicate this extraordinary sacrifice that was made of ruling types. And for the first time, note, they said that at La Venta, we were not dealing with real people, we were dealing with babies and jaguars. Now they say at Monte Alban, these people have olmecoid features. How could they have olmecoid features when they're not there is no such thing as all McCoy features because they say that the reason why these people have these peculiar kinds of faces at Leventa and those places is not because they're real people looking like that, but because they're representing the baby type or they're representing the jaguar type. Now they say they have all McCoy features. What are all McCoy features? The Afro-Asiatic, the strange face that begins in the Olmec world that touches Monte Alban. There is the revolt. Now that is not a happy note on which to end. Obviously, all great civilizations reach a certain point when they're either invaded from outside, they're struck by some tremendous cataclysm, or they become arrogant like the Aztec in later days, or the Europeans as they are becoming now, or have been for quite a while, but they're becoming more and more arrogant to a point where they may bring about, they may generate within their system a revolt that makes it impossible for them to operate with the kind of certitude with which they operate now. Most of you are filled with a sense of hopelessness when you think of the European giant, the tremendous shadow that he's thrown over the world. But let me tell you that changes have already begun to occur in the 20th century. When I was a boy, one of the things that was told to me repeatedly in which I believed is that the sun would never set on the British Empire. There was absolutely no way when I was growing up that anyone could be mad enough to imagine that Africa or the Caribbean would become independent. Now I'm not saying they're independent, it's a paper independence, but it is a step in that direction. There is a measure of independence and movement away from the metropolitan power. It seemed utterly impossible for such a thing to occur in the world. The imperialist powers of France and England and Germany were so powerful that we did not for a moment believe that anything could happen. But there lay at the heart of the system certain contradictions that eventually exploded so that the European himself without the help of the African, began to destroy himself. After the war in Europe, it was impossible for European powers to maintain their hold in Africa and the Caribbean. Riots broke out everywhere. And the more riots that broke out in Africa, the more riots broke out elsewhere. I remember the only time I heard of anything about Africans that made me feel proud and that made me feel that I could identify with them was during the Mau Mau Rebellion when the radio which we listened to as if it were the Bible, the BBC said that the British Army was closing in on an African who was the right-hand man to Kenyatta. Uh, I can't remember his name now, but he, Didan Kamati, Didan Kamati, Didan Kamati ran 40 miles on his toes to escape the pincer movement of the whole British army in Kenya and jumped away from them. It was that was the first time in my life that I heard of an African different from what I had heard of in Tarzan. That is the first time I began to think that perhaps we were dealing with something else 
other than what I had been told. It was just a flicker. It was to come later, for example, when books started suddenly to arrive from Russia in English about the revolutions in Africa, and they tried to seize these books, but they couldn't find them. They, we passed them on fast. So then the tide in the movement began and could not be stopped because suddenly, with almost a religious fervor, note, religious fervor, peoples all over the world began to become conscious of themselves as having the power to change things. That was all. They did not have guns, they did not have bombs. Everything was against them, but they had a new moral force. A new moral force that came out of a contact, not as profound as ours today, but a contact, however flickering, however faint, of another kind of history, of another kind of person. Suddenly, as if what had been buried for centuries, in history began to resurrect itself, creating a new sense of person. I was talking today with someone, and this is something that has been raised constantly by students as one travels around the country. Why is it important to talk about what blacks did in America 3,000 years ago, or in Africa 3,000, 2,000, 1,000 years ago? What does it matter? The black man is reduced throughout the world. So to talk about what he did or didn't do in ancient times is irrelevant. That is not true. That is not true because of the fact that this consciousness is where change begins. Consciousness is the beginning of a new man, beginning of force. It is like putting a plug into, in into ancient source of electricity. Something actually happens. One begins invaded with a new energy. I always remember that. There are circuits of energy in the human. Energy has nothing to do with how much food you eat or what is your native constitution. Gandhi had more energy than anybody who was weightlifting. Gandhi could walk into England with his loincloth and sit in the snow without feeling cold. That is energy. It's a different kind of energy. Energy Gandhi acquired a peculiar kind of energy because he was plugging into something that was different from what the engine had plugged into for a long time under the British. A different conception of freedom and power and dignity. When Gandhi sat at that table and the British said, of course, you don't expect we are going to leave this place, do you? And Gandhi said, yes, you're going to leave this place with an absolute confidence because he knew from the shift in consciousness that there was no way that the British could move against the tide that was riding in the, rising in the consciousness of the Indian people. They were going back to a sense of what they were. They were no longer thinking of themselves as mere extensions of that civilization. That is why we go back into history, because history, its resurrection, its reconstruction, produces different qualities in the human. It is almost like a religious energy and fervor and zeal that rises in consciousness and reshapes the people. That is why one goes back. Because it really affects the living present. Our conception of the world, our consciousness of what is happening is determined by our conception of history. If you think your history starts with slavery, as most black Americans do still, and most whites still do, and Alex Haley's roots didn't change it, merely consolidated it. If you think that history begins with slavery or with primitives in the jungle, there is absolutely no way that you can speak with confidence that you can overturn a civilization because at the root, regardless of any protest that may spring superficially from your mouth, at the very center of your being, there's an absolute conviction that you're dealing with people who are, are essentially superior in every way. They only cease to be essentially superior when you rediscover through your history that it is not so. That fundamentally there are large extent invaders who struck as barbarian forces 
other peoples captured them and destroyed not only their cities and their civilizations but sought systematically as they still do to destroy their conception of themselves as people. It is only then through that history whether it be in Mexico or in Egypt the recovery of this when one sees that one is at the very center of formative civilization Olmec was formative it wasn't just something land it wasn't just something flowering at La Venta Tres Apotes, uh, San Lorenzo in Veracruz it was to touch Mitla it was to touch Monte Alban it was to touch Tijotihuacan it was to touch Platilco all the great centers it was even to go right down into South America so that it touched Chavin Kupisnik civilization in South America and we were involved in it and Egypt was not just Cairo and the Sudan Egypt touched Europe the Greek would not have been possible without Egypt Asia and its great quantum leaps would not have been possible without Egypt that Nile Valley carried a fire into Europe a fire into Asia right through the world we were there at the heart of that and it was me it had <laughs> Glad to be back here again, dear. It's been quite a while. Yes, it's been a while. Too long. Before we actually get to you, though, we need to really uh, lay a proper groundwork for the content of this program. It needs to be known uh, just who the three critics of Professor Van Sertimer are. Bernard de Montalano of Michigan, Warren Barbour, the University of Buffalo, and Gabriel Haslip Vieira, acting director of Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College. The last two of whom, uh, Warren Barbour and Gabriel Haslip Vieira, were invited to appear, as I said in the introduction of this program, uh, to appear on the program to face uh, Professor Van Sertimer, and they declined. I got uh, Professor uh, Haslip Vieira on the telephone uh, earlier this week and really pressured him uh, and tried to get him to appear, but he said he really couldn't. And so I asked him if he would fax me then. Uh, a sort of an overview or a summary of his critiques of Professor Van Sertima. He said that he would. But the next day I got a fax letter, and I think in all fairness, because of the sensitivity of this issue, you should hear the letter verbatim. Dear Mr. Noble, after our conversation yesterday, I came to the conclusion that you were right about the best way to handle a program that deals with Ivan Van Sertima and his work. A face-to-face -face discussion between Van Sertima and one of his critics is the best way, parentheses, the only way to deal with his many claims, all of them unsupported by the environmental, historical, and archaeological evidence. Ben Sertima makes assertions about pyramids, ocean currents, terracotta figurines, the distribution of plants, the introduction of African words, and the introduction of religious and political concepts, among other claims. He also plays games with linguistics, and with racial stereotypes, for example, hair braids, and, parentheses of course, the colossal stone heads with their presumed Negroid features. All of these claims need to be responded to individually, point by point. There is no other way. Unfortunately, I cannot be present on your show. I also believe that a fact summary of our critique would be woefully inadequate to deal with the seriousness and complexity of this subject. I guess Van Sertima will simply get a free ride, but that's okay because our critique is now in print and available to our main constituents, students, teachers, and public schools, as well as faculty institutions of higher learning. Again, I want to thank you for the invitation, and please accept my profound regrets. Sincerely, and best wishes, Gabriel Haslip Vieira, PhD, Acting Director of Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College. Having said that, once again, I welcome you to the program. Good to be here. And you heard some of the things that he mentioned, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Haslip Vieira has mentioned in his letter mm -hmm. of uh, declining to appear. And let's get your overall response to what he has said here in this letter and what you are aware of. He and his two other colleagues have said in your in, in, crit, in crit, critique of your work. Uh, this is a cowardly way out. 
and an easy way out for them because they submitted to me a 55-page document. They allowed me 800 words to reply. I insisted that that is nonsense. Eventually, agreed with the editor, Richard Fox, that I would be allowed 15 pages against their 55. When I did my 15 pages, which even the editor points out was a detailed response, I asked, could I publish this after I publish it with you? He said, yes, of course, once we publish it first. Fortunately, I was advised by my lawyer not to trust him just as well, because when I asked him to put it in writing that I could republish my response, he said, no, you cannot do that unless you publish the 55 pages attack on you. In other words, to publish my 15 pages, I had to publish the 55. These three individuals collaborated on an article that was circulated to hundreds of, uh, to hundreds of subscribers of a periodical called Current Anthropology. Yes. And the article that they co-authored authored was called Van Sertima's Afrocentricity and the Almec. Yes, that was their way out to just dub all of this evidence as Afrocentricity. If this is Afrocentricity, Columbus was an Afrocentric. Because as I pointed out in July um, 1989, um, I, was pre I was invited to speak before a congressional committee because they found that I was interfering with Christopher Columbus Prince and Tennis celebration. As, an I point, as I pointed out to that committee, I'm not the first person to suggest there were Africans in America before Columbus. Christopher Columbus is the first person to say that. He actually says in the Journal of his Second Voyage that when he was in Haiti, Native Americans came to them and told them that black-skinned people had come from the south and southeast trading in gold-tipped spears. Columbus may or may not have believed, but he actually sent these spears back to Spain to be a state. They were meticulously examined in Spain. They were found to be identical with spears then being forged in African Guinea. 32 parts, 18 were of gold, 6 of silver, and 8 of copper. Not only were they identical metallurgically, the words that the Americans were found to be using for these spears, which they claimed to come from black people, the Africans were using these same words. Ghana, for example, was the name of their medieval, one of their great medieval places. And Ghana was one of the words they used for gold as well. That was one of the words for spear. Listen closely to the parallels. Ghana, Kane, Kani, Kanin, Ghani. And in the Caribbean where there was a report that these people had landed before Columbus, they have Guana, Kana, Ghani, Ghani, Ghanini. They actually use the word Ghanini to refer to the black gold merchants. Now, at our request, you have brought uh, some 22 slides. And in our next segment, we want to begin uh, to look at those slides that you have offered to us to support your contention. You have been arguing about the African presence, at least in this hemisphere, for a long time. Oh, yeah. This is not a, a new yes, argument. I have spent 27 years of my life on this. These guys have spent about 27 days pulling together their little stuff, attacking me, and I could hit everything they say down. All right. We'll see if you can live up to that. But we need to take a break, Professor Van Sertima. We'll be back with this struggle after this. Uh, since you came out with your writings about the African presence, at least that part which deals with this hemisphere, was it always under attack, or are these attacks and critiques recent? Um, there was an attack as far as Glenn Daniel was invited uh, from Britain to attack me. They wouldn't allow any American professors to comment. Eventually, however, the first man to go out in the field, Matthew Sterling was to be the first, but this Dr. Clarence Wines went out to the field and found these stone heads. And he was the first to write a letter to the New York Times about me saying that he's, after 40 years in archaeology, he's absolutely convinced of the soundness of my conclusion. All right. Now, what are we going to be looking at now? What are we going to be looking this segment, at? We're going to look at six of the first of the 22 that you've said. Yes. This is the journey that was made from the medieval empire of Mali, 1310 and 1311. And I want very quickly to go over 12 categories of evidence. Um, to show that this was not a fiction, that the, the, the evidence exists there not only... Well, what is this map based on? This map 
shows you the empire of Mali in the 14th century. And there's evidence in 12 categories showing that people from Mali made two journeys to America. One was in 1310. One captain came back. He said he found the Valent River in the middle of the sea, which would be off Brazil. How were these, uh, was this map uh, done? And who did it? Now, this is a, a map of Mali drawn in current times. Um, but it relates to earlier maps, early Arab maps of Mali, showing what Mali looked like. It was as large, say, the Arabs, as all the states of Western Europe put together. It wasn't an Arab empire, but the Arabs visited it. All right, very yeah. quickly, because we have a lot of ground to cover. What are the 12 points that you need to mention? Okay, I give you a dozen Europeans who actually saw or heard of these blacks when they came. I want to name them. I'll deal with methodological evidence that I've already dealt with methodological evidence and linguistic evidence. I'll deal with some botanical evidence, oceanographic evidence, navigational evidence, skeletal evidence, epigraphic evidence. That is a script, cartographic evidence, that's a map oral and documented evidence and iconographic evidence that is images of these people at that point in time in america all of these you have documented yes all of these are documented there's never any event in history that has 12 categories of evidence and it didn't happen all right let's go to the second slide okay all right what are we looking at now um these are the current Okay, that move... The oceanographic yes, current? Yes, that move from Africa to America. They're like marine conveyor belts. Once you're caught in these currents, you have to come to America. Oh, so that is what facilitated yes, the... Yes, that the, is what the, facilitated the movement. All right. But I think that it is very important that I do mention the people who saw black when they came. European, right, Ferdinand, Columbus saw them... Um, Columbus saw them... He heard of them in Haiti, but he saw them north of Honduras. He reports that to his son, Ferdinand. Vasco Nunez de Balboa, September 25, 1513, saw two tall Africans among the Native Americans in Panama. All right. And Peter Martyr comments on them. Lopez de Gamara, Rodrigo de Colmenares, in black, east of the Gulf of San Miguel. Um, Alphonse de Catafax presents us with a, a map by a French captain, Corhalli that shows us independent black settlements in Brazil, in Florida, and in St. Vincent. L'Abbé Brasso, the Bull Book, comes to Panama studies and finds that there are two people native to Panama, indigenous to Panama, the Native Americans, red-skinned people, the Thule, and the Mandinga, the black-skinned people. Let me intrude. All of these people mention black. All right, let me intrude because we do have a paucity of time that we're faced with. This is a slide that no, shows Kontiki. Yes. Now, this is Hyadal got from that Africans could build boats even before Christ. Okay, even before Christ. This is he the made Ra a replica. One. This is not, this is Ra one. Oh, Ra. Yes, Sorry. okay, and it was built by the Baduma people on Lake Chad, and it crossed the Atlantic successfully. Okay, and we know that story, uh, it's pretty well known. It's now, there are also other journeys, but we come now to the evidence like this, which shows you on, on the right side is a Mexican. The, the very black one is the Mexican is found at Quijotihuacan. And on the left? And on the left is an African woman. To show you the, the similarity of the similarity, the head kerchief, the earrings, as well as the face. The on same the, analogy is being drawn no, here? Here now, no. The one with the turban and the scarification, that's an African too. It's a vivid scarification. That's on the left. Yes. And on the right? And on the right, there is a black man found in Mexico that is cultured, and he was worshipped as the god as Catlipoco. It was not African, it's a Mexican. But he right. was worshipped because of the, his, he had the right ceremonial color. This? And that is a Mandingo head from the Oaxaca among the Mixtecs. And in the lower right hand? Um, that's another hand. All right. And lastly, I think we have one more slide to look at. Now, no, this is a totally this different is another segment. segment. This All is right. a different segment. Pardon my impetuosity, 
but in the interest of time... Yes, I know you have a limited time, but there's... Limited time and paucity oh. of uh, training on oh, my yes, part. A vast but we'll take... Of evidence. Let, me inter yes. let me interrupt you. We need yes. to take a break, yes. and the struggle will continue for our knowledge. Struggle continues. What plates are we going to look at now? Let's take a look at the first plate and see where we are. Now... If you see the whole play, that is just half. But the Egyptian is first in the world. This is 1,200 years before Christ, and they show him as first in the world. The second is the Indo-Aryan, and then there are two more in this same plane. Uh, it shows the Nubian, exactly like the Egyptian at this time, very Africoid, with the same costume. It's just that he has two banners of power, while the Egyptian has three, and no, then no. comes the semi. That shows you the, the state of the world at that time. All right. Now, the Egyptian had a myth about seven. Wait, we go to the, to the next slide. Yes. Um, All right, the we... reason be, I have to say something about seven before you see this, because you will see the extraordinary... Well, we'll keep it up. We'll keep it up while but, you talk. Okay. But this is one of the stone heads that appear in America. Some of them are Native American, but quite a number of them are so Africoid, they're distinct from the Native American. They've been explained away in all sorts of ways. They said they wear jaguars, half human, half jaguars. That's why they look like that. They're baby faces. They're ball players. They're divine beings. But that's the side of that head. And now look at the back of the head. These are heads that were yes, found that were in Mexico before Christ. And the circus 1200 BC, the same time you have evidence of the Egyptians making a journey to what they call the underworld in the West. And there is a contention... Now, here is the seven braided. Now, this is very important because that's their hallmark, seven. The Egyptians gave us a seven-day week. They also believed seven was important in the ages of man, seven pure reasons, seven, 14 proof with teeth, 21 maturation, seven deadly sins, seven cardinal virtues, seven orifices in the, hum orifices in the human body, seven layers of skin, seven primary colors. We're looking and at here we braided have hair. On seven braids. Okay. And my critics are saying they, that Africans never braided their hair. Europeans did. Africans never braided their hair until they were colonized. Okay. This, now here shows you an on African... On the left is a photograph yes. of an African. Yes. And from and where? On the right, this from where? From Kenya. Uh -huh. And on the right is the one of the stone heads. Now... You what? mean to tell me that your critics are contending that this stone head on the right yes. is yes. not a rendering of somebody who came from Africa? Yes. No, they say it's a, it's a spitting image of the natives. They say they wear jaguars. They say they're ball players. They say they're baby faces. What do you mean when you say jaguar? What did they mean yes. when they, they say jaguar? They said that it's half human, half jaguar, because since Olmec had a passion about the jaguar, they linked the jaguar with the human, I which see. is absurd, because the grave show the skulls and skeletons of Africans, not of jaguars. Let's move forward. Yeah, here now you see a very unusual thing, that you have a flap falling along the face, a circular air plug, parallel incised lines, identical, the identical helmet appears in Egypt, Egypt to Nubia in this period, 1200. All right, let's feet. take a look at the next one. Okay, that's what they say represents all the stone heads. They say that's a Native American and all the stone heads look like that. All right. Next. Now, they, that's the weird jaguar. They say all the stone heads look like that, the weird jaguar. just want to show you how ridiculous this is. But it's very important at this point that you should become aware of the fact that two craniologists have actually been in the graves near where these skeletons are and found clear evidence of African type. Clear evidence of African type. There's no question about it. They have actually examined all of this and they've shown well, the skeletal evidence to be clearly that here are Native Americans, the majority of people in the grave are Native Americans, and there is a type that is distinct from the Native, with all the elements that you associate with African. If you found it anywhere else in the world, you would say, these are Africans. So none of these explanations about babies and weird jaguars, there are no babies or weird jaguars or divine beings in the grave. There are Africoid types. 13.5% that Latilco, Serra de las Misas, and Monte Alban are found in the grave, 13.5%, and then they start intermarrying with the women, and it drops to 4.5%. Oh, 
over a, a number of decades. So, so your thesis is that the African took advantage of these currents in the Atlantic Ocean and used boats such as what we saw, the raw re recreation, and came to this hemisphere long before Columbus. Yes, but the Mandingo journeys are quite distinct from that of the time in the Ramesses the Star because we have a clear evidence that they sent out seven ships. It's in the tomb of the Ramesses that they sent out seven ships, and the Americans report seven ships arriving. The Popol Vuh, the, the Bible of the Kiche Mai reports seven ships arriving in harbor, and these strangers arriving. Do you have any evidence of what kind of impact the African arrival had on this hemisphere? Well, we have, as I say, evidence about the seven ships, Champollion, Leopard Bull, Rossellini, Sahago, and a whole range of people coming in on this. And the impact... Was it hostile is, or peaceful? No, it was not hostile. It was peaceful. There are later incidents between Africans and Ameri Native Americans. We, we have one case in which the Native Americans actually make a chief out of an African. I have a picture of that, them sitting together, not only in harmony, but, the, but an African chief being ma made a chief by the Native Americans. But in this period, we have no evidence of any hostility, but we have evidence of an influence. Wherever there is a contact, there is an influence. And we have evidence of 12, I have defined 12 rituals which are identical as in Egypt. They're extremely complex. They have clear antecedents in Egypt and they suddenly begin to appear during this contact period. Was, is there any evidence of any colonial activities on the no, part no, of no, the Africans no to that. colonize parts there is of... no evidence of that. You have an evidence of these people coming, you have an evidence of a, a specific contact. We don't have any evidence of colonization. They were not colonized and I never claimed that they created the Olmec civilization as my critics say. I said they influenced it. Because once you have a contact, certain influences would come in. That is true of all civilizations. Once there is a contact, certain things come in. You don't have to dominate the society in order to influence it. That is absurd. All right. But the reality is that we have to take another break. We'll be back. Four plates to look at in this segment. Uh, As I'm just presenting here, four out of 14 this is the double crown with the bird and serpent, unique to the Egyptians and the Egypto-Nubian world. Here it appears among the Olmecs. They're wearing two crowns and they have the bird and the serpent. The reason why you have the bird and the serpent in Egypt, the bird represents the upper world, I've, the I've serpent, the them. lower world. I've seen that and they in Egypt. assume they control both. This is another, the, the bird bar from Egypt. Here you find him in Mexico. He's, he's flying out of a hole in the sarcophagus, the tomb flying out with this human head. That's the identical ritual. Next. And here are two gods from Egypt on the left, two gods pouring cross beams over a third god, that ceremony. And the same thing in Mexico, where you see two gods, two Mexican gods pouring cross beams over a black god. Right. And lastly, so this is the god Sokar, standing in Egypt. He stands in the back of a snake which has a head at the head and the head at the tail and he's holding up his wings. The identical thing appears in Mexico. Now I've only, because of the brevity of the program, I'm only showing four out of 14. Science demands eight. All right. Proof of contact. I've shown 14. All right. Let me ask you a couple of uh, things. Did the culture in this hemisphere uh, practice the same entombing process that we are familiar with in Egypt. Was that, was that something that they adopted here? Do we have evidence of mummies and sarcophagus? We have evidence of mummies, but they, it is quite possible in Mexico at least, that some of them, they had their own process of mummification. mummification. In Peru, however, we have identical, not just identical substances, but the identical formula. That when we come to touch in South America towards the end, I will deal with that. Now, what about pyramid building? Uh, pyramid building, Bart Jordan, a child prodigy whom I, to whom Einstein granted special audience, has done a tremendous work on correspondences between certain Egyptian pyramids and certain American pyramids. That does not mean Egyptians taught the Americans to build pyramids, nor that they built the pyramids. I never said that. I said there are certain influences, there are certain aspects and there are certain pyramids 
where he shows in my new book, Are the America Revisited? Uh, I, he has contributed essays on the pyramid, which shows um, extremely complex relationships and correspondences which could not happen twice. Were they on the same uh, sophisticated level as the pyramids that we uh, are familiar with in Egypt, with the, the passageways? Well, they were not, not yet there. Some of them do. They're not as large, as elaborate as the Egyptian pyramids. But so we do have some which have aspects that are quite extraordinary in, in terms of their correspondence with what you find in Egypt. So I guess the question is, in lay terms, how does one, looking at this history, delineate between what was brought from Africa that we see the remains of in this hemisphere mm -hmm. and what was evolved by the indigenous people Okay, you can easily own. tell that through antecedents. The question of looking at antecedents. If you find something here for thousands of years or centuries mm -hmm. and then you look over here and you cannot find evidence of it before you, you may find pyramid building, of course, but you'd come upon a certain type of pyramid built in a certain way. Okay, that's the situation. How okay. about writings on walls? Are there any evidences of writings on the walls? Rafik Jairaz boy has cited this at Putrero Nueva. I have not seen it of hieroglyphs. And the Smithsonian of all places mentioned in April the 5th, 1909. It is mentioned in the Phoenix Gazette that they found a cave somewhere in America and they actually cordoned it also that nobody could come into this cave and they said they found Egyptian type hieroglyphs and they found evidence of certain things suggesting a movement of people at the time of Ramses, some journey at the time of the Ramses and Professor Jordan was in charge of the Smithsonian um, Institution search at that time and not a word like the something years have passed and not a word more about it. The Africans that first came to this hemisphere, did they land in the, what we now call the Caribbean, or in Central America? They landed in the Gulf of Mexico. The in the current, Gulf? They into the Gulf of Mexico. Some of the current could take into the Caribbean, but they landed in the Gulf of Mexico. That is what evidence we have. There was no... Because the seven ships, you see, that's something I must say something about. Seven was critical. That's why the seven braids is critical, because Egyptians sent out seven ships the Americans report seven ships arriving, and seven was critical to the whole mythology of the Egyptians. Did they have the same calendar? Did they have the same math? Uh, oh, there no, any uh, no. analogies between no, no, the no. African calendar or no, no, the no, numerical no. The, the Americans system? had their own calendar. The Americans had their own calendar. I see. Yes. All right. I think that we ought to take a break and gear up for the remaining segments that we have. And uh, when we come back, we'll press on with this most absorbing and, I must say, challenging discussion with Professor Ivan Van Sederman. Stay with us. The set of plates uh, are upon us, the last four. Now, these you have identified in the notes you've given me as covering South America. Yes. Let's take a look at them. Now, this is a very important map because recently scientists discovered South American cocaine in seven ancient Egyptian mummy. Well, this is kind of muddled, to be honest with um, you. How, you know, this, what is it um, really? On the right is the outlines of West Africa, the West African I coast. See. And on the left is the outline of the South American coast. And what are those sunburst lines in the middle there? Well, they're, they're, they, these are some kind of measurement system. But what, what it indicates, what it has, be, has been established, that this map, is, has accurate latitude and longitudinal coordinates between the African Atlantic coast and the South American Atlantic coast. Nobody could have drawn this map at the time of Columbus. They did not know, not until uh, between 1492 and 1744, until the chronometer was invented, nobody could have drawn this map. So this when, is, when do you contend this was drawn? No, it, we don't contend. We know for a fact it that was, this was pre-Christian Egypt. They have found this in a pre-Christian context. It was found by a Turkish admiral in Egypt, he raised, and it has been established this is a pre-Christian map. And this is, uh, but you're saying that Columbus didn't have the wherewithal to do a map of oh, the no, calendar. Oh, no, no. At the time of Columbus, you could not possibly draw such right. a map. Let me just point to certain, 
four little things quickly in this map that Very could good. not have been done at the time. And these are shown in this map. It was not discovered until 1527 by Cesaro. Um, then we have the Trato River in Colombia is shown for distance of 300 miles. Nobody knew about that. The Amazon River is shown the actual course of the river. In contrast, even in the 16th century, European map show no resemblance to the All right. Let's That's just let, a few feet. Let, let's move forward. Yes. Now, the, here is the Peruvian. Um, this is an African type found in Peru. This is a rendering of a head that was found in, in Peru. Yes. Okay. And the next? That's another sculpture found in Peru. In Peru. Yes. The Colombian. This is another one. One would say that looked like a, a brother. Yes. Well, my critics would say it's impossible that it could be a brother because brothers do not cross oceans until they're taught by Europeans. There's a total racist thing. They actually said, uh, Half Levera and the Montelano had said, said that Native Americans would have sacrificed and eaten the Africans if they came. And they, they, uh, they go so far as to say they totally ignorant of the ancient Egyptian. They said all Egyptians have long, narrow, Egyptians and Nubians have long, narrow noses, broad, flat noses are confined to the ancestors of African Americans. All right. L let me just talk to you straight up about what this may all be about in your, in your esteem, uh, estimation. Is this really um, an attempt to sort of Put a, a particular spin on history that may be uh, that may validate some people and invalidate other people. Well, in my case, I am beyond that. Okay, there is there are some writers on Africa who try to present perhaps some fantasies or fiction about Africans. I am not concerned with that. Okay, I'm concerned with finding out the truth about Africa and. The evidence here is indisputable. It is utterly indisputable. Because these maps have been studied, it is very clear that the facts presented here cannot be refuted. What they are doing is just dismissing it. For example, I presented 12 categories of evidence in the Mandingo case. I didn't get a chance to mention it on this program because of the lack of time. Twelve categories of evidence. All they have to say, they dismiss it in one sentence. There's absolutely no evidence. They don't argue with any of it. They don't disprove any of it. Have you had an opportunity to confront and debate with your I accusers? debated with one of them, Warren Barbour. There's an article in the Buffalo, one of the Buffalo newspapers, Van Sartma wins by a knockout. Um, and with regard to the Montelano, who is another one of my critics, he'd been circulating secretly things against me in the Michigan schools. Some, some of my books were withdrawn from the schools until eventually some honest teacher passed it on to me, and then I got a chance to reply, mumbling to the Montelano. Is the friction that you've been getting confined to these three individuals? No, 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 Hasle Vera, I don't know at all. They are concerned, they, 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 they are concerned to present this is not just in current anthropology quite a number of magazines have been issued recently with attacks on me by these three gentlemen they've joined and it's a trio of critics who have joined together i respond to all of this criticism in my new book early america revisited which has a, a vast body of new evidence it doesn't just restrict itself with what i knew and they came before columbus have they done a, an analogous amount of writing on their own, any of these three Oh, no, they, they are totally unknown. This is their chance to... They have they, no books that they've written? They, no, none of them, as far as I know, have written any books. This is their chance. They come together, and their total concern and attack has been on me. Well, someone on the street might say, Professor Van Sertema, if these are relative unknowns, they haven't written a book, and they just put this in a periodical, why are you so upset about something that you should be able to the brush away? The reason is because thousands of dollars, I presume it may even be a million dollars being spent on this. This attack on me is being circulated to hundreds of schools. 
and universal. And it is being adopted? By it, it's being read, and because they do not have the counter evidence, because they do they not have the counter, uh, they accept this as these are uh, Van Sertman is lying, this is not a valid history, etc. This is Afrocentricity. They actually call it Van Sertman's Afrocentricity in the all right. Last break. Last segment coming right up. Stay with us, please. What would be the best way to have an honest, useful discourse and discussion uh, about these differing opinions. What would be the best arena? In a lecture process, um, in the written word? Uh, how, what would be the best scene where this discussion could really benefit everybody who saw and, and heard it? Well, you see, um, I have had a debate with one of these people, Warren Barbour. You told me that. Okay, but, but there is no... Um, they limited me, for example, to 45 minutes. You've mentioned that. Yes. But what would be your ideal? Because maybe we can, you know, play a role uh, in bringing the three of them to face you. I wouldn't you, like to you wouldn't want all to three of them together. I'd like to have, I would like to have my colleagues with me. Okay? No three against one, because that's exactly what they do with current anthropology. They limit me a certain amount of time, and they hog the time, they hog the pages, etc. So it would be that three again? not gives me, therefore, yes. You, you, Who would I'm the other two be? Okay, one of them would be Dr. Finch. Okay. Of? Um, Dr. Finch is an Atlanta. Uh-huh. And, and who would the other be? Yes, I, I, will, I, will, I will name the other, because I have a number of names in mind. I would rather name that at a later date. Should this be done on television, yes, or should, should be. this be done in it some should. sort of an academic arena? Whatever arena. public forum there could be, because I remember when I had to face Barbour, I was limited to four to five minutes. I understand. Okay, and that you see, that is the kind of, that is very unfair because it meant that he could lay a whole attack on me, presenting no hard evidence on his part. They don't have to present evidence; they just have to attack. Well, and, I, I'm, and I'm limited to a certain amount of time to respond, which is not fair. It means, therefore, I merely appear to be responding rather than presenting the evidence because there's a massive amount of evidence which I could not even begin to mention here because of the limit of time. Is, it, is this unusual or doesn't this happen frequently between historians who have differing perspectives of history? No, I think I have seen some fair debates where people have had an opportunity to present all the facts. I have seen that in, in various debates. But there's a limited amount of time, and you would have a situation in which you cannot present evidence. Take, for example, I could say in closing, they found two African skeletons in the West Indies, mm -hmm. in a grave before Columbus, dated 1250 AD. The Smithsonian itself said that they're morphologically African. They said there was a filing of incisive teeth which was restricted to certain Atlantic Africans in the pre-Columbian period. But then they went to carbon date them, they found they could not. So they had to date them stratigraphically. That is the layer in which they were found. They found the Native American ornament around the forearm of one of the skeletons. And they found other kinds of evidence showing that these are pre-Columbian Africans. Let's open up a chapter for our young viewers who perhaps have not heard this discussion at all. Uh, except for perhaps the mention of Christopher Columbus. What would you recommend to a youngster in their reading to really begin to get into this whole discussion and to understand what the implications are of the whether one version is told or another? Okay, the most important reading would be my new book, Are You America Revisited? Because I have done that in the light of a vast number of new, a vast amount of new evidence, and I have made it in such a way that the, any student can understand. Are there writings that offer a different perspective that you would recommend that a student read to balance off against yours, or are you just saying, just read mine and that's the truth? No, I, I think if something is a fact and it is supported by 12 categories of evidence, you don't come and say, read so-and-so, okay, who shows that these skeletons were not found, when the skeletons are found. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. They have to fight their own battle. Are there uh, other readings that you would recommend that support and show other dimensions of your uh, a thesis? It's important to read Dr. Finch's new book, Star of Deep Beginnings, because like my book, Blackfenstein, he shows you the level Africans reached in various places, whereas they dismissed just the primitives in the jungle. That's why it becomes so difficult to believe that they could cross oceans like other people, so difficult to believe that they could influence any other civilization. One is not trying to establish some superiority of the African. One is trying to establish that there are many fictions. And we have thousands of books filled with these fictions. And we cannot change that um, where you have we uh, have to fight three professors. And yet when you fight them and you show all the kinds of lies they have made, then you have a situation in which you have to give them equal time. And then when you give them equal time, they refuse to appear. Well, in a, in a fair presentation of an issue, it is always helpful to at least suggest what the critic is oh, yes. before we hear the response to the, uh, yes. to the criticism. For a young person, I'm concerned about that, why should a young person go outside of their normal curriculum and pursue this. You're suggesting that this is very important. Yes. And this is something that is important for the soul as well as the mind. In what way? Well, it is important because the dis lots of people behave as inferiors because they've come to believe they are inferior. The history does more than anything else. False history does more than anything else to create that. I was at London University, and at the end of the first year, I went to study Africa. That was a big mistake. At the end of the first year, I tried to commit suicide. What? Yes, I drank poison. The doctors, I Why? was unconscious. Because everything that I was taught w made it quite clear to me that all Africans were primitive. Most of them lived in the jungle. They never had any inventions, any science, etc. This, is, this was pounded into me day and day. And yet, coming out of that coma, I decided I will never be the same person again. I have to look, I have to find for myself, create for myself another world. I have to find out what really happened in Africa. That was the beginning of a new life for me. I, for example, in spite of the fact that my professors had, were all doctors of law and language, they had worked for several years in the Swahili dictionary, I ended up compiling the dictionary. They would not go to the sources, the primary sources. I actually entered the court in Tanzania, went and studied the documents, quoted from the documents. They sat in their little palaces writing about Swahili law. I actually went and got the primary documents. So, so that in, is very important. So in excavating this uh, dimension of history, has really helped you find self. Yes, indeed. And your own definition of who you are and also understanding what the world is all yes. about. And it didn't come from any Afrocentric vision. Man is man is man. I don't believe in inferior, superior people. It was an attempt to find out what lay behind the falsehoods of history. Those things that were being taught us that were constantly destroying us and reducing us. Professor Van Sotomayor, this has been absorbing, challenging, stimulating, and I thank you. And maybe we can get something going on in the future. Maybe I can find a way to corral and control the use of these slides. Yeah. But I hope you'll agree.